Hello, this is Angel Felix, and we are the data science learning community. We are exploring the book explanatory model analysis, and we are in chapter 19, residual diagnostic plots. So the objectives for these chapters are in this session is present graphical methods for detailed examination of model performance. So we previously, we saw model performance, but now let's see how we can study uh, that more in detail in general, but also in a specific levels. And we are going to use residuals to make that possible. And the residuals can be used to identify potentially problematic instances. So if you have a problematic instance, then you're going to use the tool for local level uh, exploration. This can help to define which factors contribute most significant to the prediction errors. So your main important factors in this case, if you are watching a wrong predictor, would be the, the ones that are most means, you know, misrepresented. So you will think about, hey, would I need to transform this factor or would I need to just remove it and add something different? Uh, another is that any, uh, any system, systematic derivation from the expected behavior. So uh, the behavior of the residuals, if there are no, you know, close to zero, if there are, there is a, a, skewed, a skewed distribution residuals, we're going to see that. So the possible, the possible, uh, if you see that problem, a systematic derivation in the residuals, you need to think about the omission of the variable. Maybe we are missing some important information of this model. Uh, the, the inclusion of variable in uh, incorrect form, uh, so maybe you may need to transform this, you know, or maybe use another type of model that can really pick the, that trend. And we also can identify the larger predictor errors irrespective ir to the overall performance of the predictive model. Look, Let's talk about the quality of our predictions. A perfect model is that uh, the predicted value that we are, that the model is creating is the same to the actual value of the variable of every observation. That you know that would be a perfect model. A model, of course, we are talking about with the test data. If you have a model that fit this with the training data, you have an overfitted model, not a good model. <laughs> so we are always using the testing data to make this, this test. We want to predict, uh, we want the prediction to be reasonably close at least. You know, as we cannot uh, make this possible, it's always some variability in our predictions. We want it to be at least close to the actual values. To identify, to quantify the quality of prediction, we can use the difference between the predicted value and the actual value called as residuals. And we can see the formal definition. A residual is the actual value minus the prediction. Or we can also have this representation. So let's talk about the characteristics of a good model. The value of the model, we need to study the behavior of residual as for a group of observation. So you don't say, hey, we have a, we, a weird term and we have this error and you just take it in isolation. No, you need to check a group. Ah, I have a group of observation in this situation. Let's explore this. There are, uh, they are deviating from zero randomly in implying that the distribution should be, so if, when we said that they need to deviate randomly from zero, that also means that the distribution should be symmetric around zero. So you have your residual, they be, you cannot have more points over zero or below zero. So they should be symmetric. Uh, so the mean also 
or the median value should be also zero, you know. Otherwise, you are making, you are underestimating your predictions or overestimating your predictions. It, it's not close to zero. The value are close to zero uh, to show low variability also. So what, what tools do we have? We can explore, we can use the histogram of residuals to check the symmetry of location. So if you have a longer tail to the left, you know that it's not symmetric. You have a longer tail to the right, it's not symmetric. They should be the same left bow. And also the location that is the higher, the higher bar is the location of the distribution. Here, the, the location is perfect for this example because it's in zero and it's perfectly symmetric. That's the behavior that we expect for most of our models. And also, yeah, it is really good because it doesn't have any assumptions of the shape of the distribution, but really the, quant the quanta, quanta plot to share the research uh, follow a concrete distribution and most of the time is the normal distribution. So all your points fit in this line, basically you have your sample, Sorry. So we have, you have here your sample values and also your hypothetical. If they follow the same line here, it's because they are as they were expecting by the distribution. If you have a higher percent of values on those ranges, for example, you will see how the, rather than having a, a range line, they will have some curves. We will see it later. Also, we have the standardized or Pearson residuals. It's basically the residual on the, the square root of the variance of the residuals. The point is that the variance of residuals is estimated. And we have some techniques to make that possible. In the classical linear regression model, we can use the the design metrics. For the classical linear regression model, we have also the, the same metrics. And I don't know what does it mean. It was mentioned in the book. Some of you have any understanding about this? Are you asking about the, what this, the design uh, matrix is? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's just uh, a matrix of, you know, for, for a linear regression, it would be a column of ones for the intercept and then the values of all the, the, the features. Uh, so, uh, I think that's what we're talking about there. Just because, just a matrix of all the observations in a matrix format, plus plus a constant one for the uh, for the intercept term. Okay, great. Okay, and for the Poisson regression that we use for count, is expect the value of the count do the distribution of Poisson that you know the, the mean the variance is the same. And for complicated mode, they assume is a constant for overall residuals. So basically what they say here is, hey, use the same assumption that we use for the linear regression. That's, that's basically. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think this, this part in particular is really interesting about standardizing the residuals. Uh, I, I would say in, in real life, a, a lot of times, you know, the, the, your, your variance uh, of your residuals is gonna increase uh, with, with kind of your mean expected value. Right. So, and that's, that's why you have like g generalized linear models, uh, that are used oftentimes to model instead of like classical linear regression, right? Like a, a gamma regression or, uh, um, 
<laughs> there's there's a couple other ones there, but but in re reality, a lot of things you're measuring tend to be right skewed, uh, not not normally distributed. So you kind this this standardization process is 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 uh, an attempt to take care of that, so that you you basically have more of a, a normal looking uh, not those, you know. uh, pattern, uh, right? Uh, the one thing that confuses me about this is, you, you know, let's let's talk about a machine learning model. Let's just talk about a random forest, for instance. Uh, that doesn't have the underlying assumptions of of like a generalized linear model, like a gamma regression, right? Where where there's a specific form of the variance, so it's easy to standardize that. You, you know, there there is no explicit assumption in a random forest about what the, the variance should be, um, as it relates to kind of the mean prediction. And so I think, you know, you mentioned this, Angel, the book is talking about just, just using one constant, uh, you know, assuming that the residuals are kind of constant across all values of the prediction. And I, I don't necessarily think that's a good assumption. Uh, so, you know, I, I kind of see problems with, with looking at the residuals for more of a, a black box type machine learning model. Uh, because I, I, you know, I just don't think there's a, a great way out of the box to how to how to properly standardize those residuals. Well, they explain that even though random forest doesn't have an explicit distribution, you know, but the that the residuals needs to be randomly distributed is also an assumption of random forest. You know, they are expecting to somehow reduce that variation. They, they, there's a paragraph almost at the end that they they explain that explicitly talking about random forest. Um, let me let me check a book. Yeah, and and while you do that, I, I just make some additional comments. I mm -hmm. I think back to my my own work, you know, modeling insurance claims, which is a very you know skewed right tail <laughs> distribution. Uh, if I'm using like a gamma regression right or generalized linear regression from the gamma family yeah. uh the the variance of those predictions is going to increase when you're predicting higher values and it, that variance is going to be lower when you're predicting lower claims values for for given mm -hmm. um, in, insureds and again for like, if you're using a random forest model you, you, it's almost like you if, it's not sure that you have it, that. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't want to assume constant variance. Like my mm -hmm. residuals are gonna are gonna be higher mm -hmm. um, when I'm when the, when the model is predicting uh, higher claims costs, right? And I, I just don't think the the book really gave great insight on how to deal with that, other than just assume it's constant, which again I I don't I don't like as a as a potential solution. They see as a part here. You see here's the paragraph. Okay. For models like linear regression, such as heterostatistics, you know, or residual would be a be a worry, you know. In random forest, however, in my less concern, you know, mess, but they see it as a problem, you know. Typically, they might do it the fact that the models reduce variability of residual by introducing bias. And at the end, it's a decision of your of the investigator, like. It's no like a, if you have that kind of shape, you know, for a linear model, you cannot use that linear model. That's it. For random forest, you could, but they prefer you don't. You know, like if you can make some adjustments to fix this, it's better. That that's the point. I, I yeah, but I don't think the book gave a good explanation for standardizing the residuals. I think to your point, they, they basically just said, hey. If you're going to graph the residuals for like a random forest, it's going to look weird. <laughs> Just expect that, right? <laughs> they don't. They don't really say. Here's a way you can transform it so that it kind of looks like a standard normal. Uh, mm, okay, yeah. They 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 are not expecting to transform the residuals. You know, they are expecting you transform the model or the your factors in order don't have in this shape. Yeah, like random forests. I don't think are. I, I think what the book is saying is. It, it tends to bias towards the average, the predictions. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not good with extreme values, either small or large. Yeah. Uh, right. Um, and I, all I'm saying is I, I wish there was a better way to 
and there probably is a technique out there, it's just not in this book, to, to transform those residuals in such a way to kind of account for those biases. Uh, you know, just to make sure you're, you're, you're getting a result that's expected, right? Like we, we know that there's some problems with random forest, but is, is there something else kind of going on here and it, beyond kind of what the biases that are typical of a random forest? Like, you know- You have few examples, these, yeah. <laughs> the chart, I don't know if it helps you make that decision uh, of residuals uh, other than, you know, we don't expect it to look like a standardized, a standard normal distribution. Yeah. No, yeah, we don't we don't expect it, but that's maybe the goal, you know. The main goal is to see it like that. Even though uh, mm -hmm. guys, uh, one thing I I I can add to the discussion is that for example, in the in the regression models, you know, the the traditional regression models, let's say um, linear regression, you know, OLS, ordinary linear regression. Uh, one of the things that it can do that usually the three based models are not, you know, uh, are not capable of doing is to extrapolate, you know, some values. If you run a random forest and you try to uh, predict a value that is outside the range, the range of that uh, predicted value that you have, the actual value, uh, it won't work. Okay, it will always be bounded between that minimum and maximum of those actual values. Right. Okay. So yep. you have to be very careful in terms of the of those outliers. Okay, that you know tree based uh, 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 algorithms they're going to have problems trying to predict that uh, value that is outside that range. In terms of the linear regression, it would extrapolate that. The problem is that because the linear regression has these assumptions, then, you know, you have to validate that model against, you know, the assumptions of, uh, you know, heteroscedacity, uh, you know, random, ra random uh, residuals, et cetera. So I believe that this is more applicable to that kind of, uh, of model, not really the three base uh, models. I think uh, that the, the 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 constant variance is most important because you make inference with those models, and random forest is more for prediction. Like when you have a, a linear model and you have, for example, a good performance, but you have the problem of the 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 no constant variance. Then what you cannot do is to make inference with those models. You can you can still make predictions. Because it's good at predicting, but math is bad for inference. Yeah, I think that for that, maybe that's the reason why you can, even though you have these shapes, you can still use random forest because you are not using it for inference, you are using it for prediction. Okay, I, I kind of get that, right? But, <laughs> but but again, this is about just just kind of a, a subjective view of does your model mm -hmm. look nor right? It's it's not like can I use this to to um you know create confidence intervals or anything like that. Exactly. You know, that's mm -hmm. that's not the 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 subject of this mm -hmm. chapter. But it is like, are there are is your model a good fit or not? I, I think it kind of goes along with. That other chapter we were looking at with like model metrics, right? This is just kind of a, a graphics view. And again, I'm I'm still left left a little bit dissatisfied with what I should be looking at in terms of residuals if I want to use that as a tool for a black box model. But yeah. that, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, let's continue. We we will see more in the in, in the examples. So mm -hmm. they have a little a uh, some some paragraph related how we can use residual for classification models. And basically, it's a challenge. <laughs> that that's it. So there's no they not focus most in in, in this part. They say that the, the, the residuals are in this range, and they are not they are not really used. That you should use is the standardized residual that we saw before using this formula. But they also recommend to make some steps. If all your exploratory variables are categorical, something really weird, you know, you or at least 
you make it better. You make it, you know, <laughs> you make it categorical. If you break your, 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 your variables in categories, then you can apply this technique. You can group uh, your pred uh, in groups, your observation groups. So you can use this function to, to calculate the standardized, uh, to, basically to, to get the variance, to standardize the, the residuals. Right, and that's the formula for a binomial distribution, the, the variance of the, of the mean. Yeah, mm -hmm. all right. So it's a binomial, that's, that's, that's the way that they recommend to others, so. Yeah, so, and again, you know, uh, like um, a logistic regression, for instance, it's kind of similar to that, like where it has a defined form, there's a, you know, explicit relationship between the variance and the mean. And, and, and this is kind of what, you know, they're doing something similar here. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So it's like um, they explain also that once you have these standardized residuals, you can use the index plot to find out weird cases. As you see here, uh, it's over uh, 2.5, I think, yeah, 2.5 here. So it's weird, it's over 5% of these numbers. So you should check those points. But of, of course, this 2.5 is with the assumption of normality. That's not always the case. But well, at least have some guidance in the case of the, the let's see, the result for categorical models. So in the rest of the chapter, we are going to talk just about uh, for numeric, uh, for regression models. So uh, talking about just about the linear regression models, because they focus like, let, let's see a review of how we can use the result to interpret that model. Then we can see how, how much of this we can extrapolate to the general modeling. So we expect for linear regression, the residual should be normally distributed around zero. And the lab, the leverage values from the diagonal of the hat matrix, and here's the definition hat matrix. I didn't know about the hat, the hat matrix. It's basically a matrix that used to, to get the predicted value based on the original value you train the model. And it's this expression is a really good way to to measure to you know the diagonal or the matrix is a really good way to to see how weird is an observation do it the other observations that's that's basically the point it's like a a distant matrix uh, or how weird is that is that and we can also approximate the variance using that has metrics. So we have important properties, but the most important part is the diagonal. Uh, for independent exploratory variables, that is the assumption that the variables are independent. You don't have any correlations. It should lead to a constant variance of residuals. That's basically the assumptions. This will be around zero and constant variance. And we have the first plot that we see using your space R. Residual function, residual in function of predicted values. The plot should show points uh, scattered sy sy symmetrically around the horizontal straight line of zero. And that's not the case. You know, this is a line and they should be the same, you know, but they, they are no half. What we have, it have got shape of owner, reflecting increasing variability. So you, as you increase the prediction, you increase the variability. You see that? Uh, the variance is not constant, almost, almost elasticity violation. We have almost elasticity violation. Also, the smooth line suggests that the mean of residual becomes incredibly positive. So it's like you see the zero here, but the the smooth line is over that line. So it's like it's not over almost always it's not just increasing the variance, as you know, the distance between the points are getting higher, but also they are moving from the from the zero mean. So that we, we this linear regression for this example is not 
matching any of the assumptions. Also, we have the square root or standard residuals in function of predicted values. Uh, really similar. Uh, they were expecting uh, symmetrically across the horizontal, but that doesn't happen. We also have the same, we see how it increased, you know? And they were expecting like a horizontal line and that's not the shape that we are getting. Also, we have the standard residuals in function of the leverage. So we can see here that the leverage is a measure of how far away the independent variable, the independent values of the observation are from the from those that the other observations. So basically, yeah, it's how we're so we have normal observations in this side, and here we have more weird cases. Uh, data points with large residuals, or layers, and high leverage might distort the outcome and the accuracy of any regression. And we also can see the, how this affects to the predicted sum of squares. Why? Because we can also reinterpret the sum of squares as this function. Is the the square, the yeah, the square of residuals under the leverage. And what happened here? If you have high residual and also high leverage, what would you have? A, a, a lower number here that at the end will make a really big sum of a square. That will also affect your model. And for this plot, what you should check is to have both cases. So, yeah, it, having leverage is not so good, but it's not so bad. The, the main purpose is that it doesn't cross the good distance. The good distance is a measure of effect of dealing with, deleting a given observation. If you have a high leverage number with also a high residual, then the mo this plot is suggesting, hey, you maybe get a better performance if you omit uh, that observation for your modeling fit. Of course, this is all seen just the training data. Also, we can, we can, ah, we're watching the same residual. And given that the standardized residuals Approximate standard normal distribution only five percent. Yeah, I think this point no, is not good. Uh, 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 should be larger than uh, two point five seven. So that's why we are pointing the observation one hundred forty three and the observation fifty nine because they exceed uh, the number of observations. Uh, with that high residual, that, that's the point. But that's under the normal distribution assumption. And here we also can see the quartile plot. Uh, and we see how the, mo the data doesn't fit where with the data. So we don't expect this data uh, fit into the normal distribution. So let's use these techniques for the apartment prices. And we are going to check the linear model and also the random forest. And they they made the, the important uh, statement that both models have a really similar performance. So if you load your package, get the models, and create a plan and using your testing data, you can uh, get the model performance and you can compare the root mean square error is, yeah, it's the same mean root square error. So they are making the same, you know, even though they are really different models. We are going to explore that, do the residuals. If you don't use residuals, uh, you don't have any reason to think one over other. And just say, ah, oh, just to take the assumption that simplicity is always better, you know, that 
uh, the uh, complex model that is a random for but is that not your concern? You don't have problem with this. Also, we have more tools to understand random forest than before. Yeah, you need a deeper understanding to select one of the two models. Let's, let's start with the residual distribution. And we see that the distribution of residual of both are really different. The residual for random forest, they are centered around zero. So the prediction on average are close to the actual value. So if we see here, the random forest is centered here, but the linear regression is centered here. So basically random forest is centered closer to zero than the linear regression. So in, in general, they get better values. The, the skewedness indicates that there are some predictions uh, that the model has significantly underestimated in the actual value. So we have a really right tail. So you are underestimating many values and that making a lot of residual that doesn't that doesn't occur in the linear model. In the linear model, we have a multimodal distribution of residuals. We have around 200, around 400. And basically we are omitting some maybe binary variable. It's like an important thread that the linear model is not getting that, yeah, the random foreign is getting. And that's the and that's the way that you can get you can okay. use the package. Okay, yeah. I was checking the book. Mm -hmm. Um the the chart the the chart that is on the on top, you know, the the, the blue mm -hmm. the blue one is referred as the linear regression. Yeah. It's kind of backwards. No, no, it's in this way. I run the function for that reason. Rather okay. than copying the the yeah, for the, the photo from the book. Okay. And that's because when I was reading the, the notes about linear regression, I was like, hey, this note doesn't make sense. They are talking about random forest. It was the linear model is in fact split, a split in and uh, to separate normal like. And that's the point. You see linear regression is not split. The split one is random forest. Right. So they mix, you know, they mix that. I don't know why this plot is getting, but you use the package and make the plot yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and you will have the correct chart. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah, so. That's interesting. So there's yeah. an error in the, in the book. Yeah, this is an error in the book. There, there, there okay. is no. <laughs> That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh my gosh. But that was, I was reading the split. Yo, uh, they are not split, the split random. I mean, you know, like, in this package is as very secure because you you write the notes here. Linear regression is speaking from this part, so it's not like uh, there is no way that we can you know miss this. Yeah, and um, and we are also uh, we are going to use this example across the the next pages. You will see that yeah, it's in this way. There was an error in the in the label. I don't know why. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> And as we saw before, we also can use the same function, you know, but just uh, changing the the geon to boss plot. I've also found that this plot function have documentation. You will need to use the triple, you know, points <laughs> because it's not an exporting function, but it's documented. And I was was able to use the show of layers. So yeah, just to show you that is there are more functionalities that you can get using this this running this function. So if we compare the two distribution residual, we see how the random forest have better mean, you know, have better median of residuals is closer to zero, you will get better predictions in general if you use random forest. But you also will get a higher tail, as we saw in the prior uh, histogram. 
and um, yeah, and that's the way your what do you prefer? What is using one of based on this situation uh, to get one of these? Uh, you will need to know how is higher to you. What is better to get most accurate predictions and this result with large residuals or just a step with the with the linear regression? Of course. Uh, we can try to transform and try to use transform transform our features in order maybe to reduce the tail of the random forest or improve the the accuracy because they explain hey maybe you were uh, missing a lot of them. Hey um, Angel, this is interesting. I mean, are, do we think this plot is correct? Yeah, it's correct because look, well, because when I look at that top uh -huh. mm -hmm. chart. That seems to be consistent. Oh, I, I think we are right. That okay. So like that that chart right here, the first one with random forest, you see the the the, the big whisker on exactly. right. That seems mm -hmm. to be, and and the median residual is kind of closer to zero. That does mm -hmm. in fact seem to be closer to that that top chart we were looking at before of the histogram. So is that does that sync up right? Can we look at that one more time? Exactly. You see the random forest have a long tail. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's right. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's consistent that the error yep. was in this chart, and we are going to continue watching the same pattern. Yep. So right. random forests have a long tail, but bare predictions. What is easier to see here is that it have bare predictions, because I tell I tell here that the random the location of random forest was closer to zero, but it's really hard to see in a histogram. You know. It's really hard to see it. It's like I see them and uh, to me are almost the same. <laughs> but really uh, random for us, I get best results. Also we we're getting some values, important part of the distribution passing around zero. Yeah, so you take the medium that you know that 50% are much better than the linear regression, always. And that, that's an interesting point. So yeah, if you want to, to me, the thing that I learned here is that if you want to compare how is how is the variability, yeah, I use histogram, but I want to check how where is located, yeah, then I switch to boss plot. It's easier to see, it's clear. Yeah, random forest is better in location. <laughs> They also explain when the hey, but remember that we saw an important when we were using the PDP plots, we saw this important difference between the linear regression and random forest uh, related to the year of construction and the price. For linear regression, the year of construction doesn't have any impact, but for random forest, you see that you have cheaper houses around the, the 1940 and the 1980s, you know, have a new shape. And that's the shape that random forest is getting that doesn't allow, you know, a linear regression to go as well as it, it, it does, you know? And, and this is because the linear regression model just had, I'm assuming, year as a predictor and, and not something more complicated. It didn't have like um, a cubic spline or something in there so that it could pick up the nonlinearity. Yeah, or maybe just to to create a new variable to to, to get, because making a U-shape is no hard you do a equation. You just need to multiply and create a new factor, you know? Or use a polygon maybe, you know. Yeah, uh, I, I think the point here is just a straight up linear regression with year as one predictor is not gonna exactly do it yeah, justice. To, to, to get that kind of shape, yeah, you need a spline, you know, for yeah, that. yeah, I would agree. Because yeah, mm -hmm. because it's you know the, the 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 way that the equation is structured is going to be always linear. <laughs> the relation, mm -hmm. Right? And that's one of the precepts that the variables have to be linear, uh also linearly with the with the observed value. Yeah, that's right. Also, maybe a, a, a split, you know, they make the uh, different linear parts. 
also. But well, well, you, you, you could have a square term in here, right? I mean, I guess that you could get a, par a parabola, but I don't think it would fit this particularly well. <laughs> well, the point is that they explain that here is the point that you need to improve in order to improve yeah. the residual of the linear regression. Um, yeah, yeah. I think if, if your goal is to use linear regression, that PDP plot would be a good indication that you know you need to do something with that year uh, variable, like with a spline or you know higher order terms or something, if you want to accurately capture the relationship. Exactly, and, and that that's the point. You use residual oh. as a signal. Hey, we have something here. Uh, the signal uh, comes from here. Hey, we have a multimodal. Why we have a multimodal? And then you go to your tools, you know, for a model explanation. And then you will go, oh, that's why the year, the construction year is important for random forest, but not important for linear regression. Why? And then you go to the PDP plot. Ah, the, that's, the... that's a good point. So that, that's mm -hmm. probably why, why we're seeing the multimodal distribution of the residuals is because, mm -hmm. you know, we probably we just don't, we're not modeling things correctly in the linear regression. As it exactly. to construction year. Yeah. Exactly. Uh -huh. But yeah. you know, it like just just as simple with the linear regression. Don't keep it simple so you can compare with the other model and then learn from the other model, maybe to improve the linear or improve the random forest. So yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I can I can say just in my own work experience, a lot of times you want to go with a simpler model. Mm -hmm. Uh because it, it particular because it's just easier to explain to you know whoever you're delivering results to and and so you might in fact like like you mentioned angel have have both a random forest and a linear regression the ran, random forest kind of provides you with suggestions to improve your linear regression but still keep things interpretable exactly yeah mm -hmm. yeah so now you you have this view and you can really understand why you have a multimodal regression and that's the variable that was missing you know Maybe you can even tune your model to say, hey, if year is in this year, place true in other false, and that's a binary variable. I think that's the they are suggesting, you know, in the in the middle of the contest, they say that it's a binary. Maybe you say, hey, if it's between 1940 and 1970, no, 19 or 80, you place just a binary variable. And that would help the linear model to split this shape. You know, from this other shape. Okay, let's study about the. Let's focus just in the random forest residuals. A random forest, as the linear regression assumes that it should be homocedastic. That very should be uh, that the variance. Uh, to be constant, basically. They just, I just copied that from the book. Uh, I don't know where they are taking this from, but they assume that the, <laughs> the variance is constant. Well, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, that, the, the model itself makes no such assumptions, right? We know that. Um, mm -hmm. It's just, I thought they, they basically said, in, in lieu of any other assumptions, you might want to just assume uh, homoscedasticity uh, yeah. for simplicity. Yeah, I think, yeah. Also, you don't want to have something different in your predictions. So basically, look look at this plot. We are plotting the, the residual versus the real values. So you are basically saying that if you have a high value, you will always underestimate, you know? If you have a low value, you will always overestimate, you know? If you take this to production, you will have problems because this is discrimination. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, that's that's a good point. I mean, I, to me, it's, all, it's all about the bias, bias variance trade off, right? Like you just you want to mm -hmm. be wrong on average, or you, you know, or you know, the spread of this of how far you're off. You know, both of those things are, are pretty pretty important. Yeah. So uh, you just imagine in the in the practical way. I want to see almost elasticity. I don't want to to increase my error with the value. I don't. I don't want if I, if I explain this model. Just imagine, go to somebody. Hey, I overestimate your situation because you have a high value. 
uh, it's something really bad. So I think even though you don't have a statistical, you know, rules to make that, in just taking that to the real world, that's a really bad model in that situation. <laughs> so, yeah. For that, and that's always, you know, if you have a large observated value, you will have a, a positive. If you have a small, you have negative. And yeah, that's really bad. And basically they are going to, we are going to see many plots that show the same thing. I think that they want us to show how, how many ways you can see the same thing just in case that you cannot see in one, you can see it in other. I think that is the purpose why they say, hey, you can check actual values versus residuals. But also you can check the same trend using actual values versus predicted. You know, and, and check this, but um, you should have a straight line and you see how the line here uh, is not following. It's completely different. It's the same problem that you are facing. The problem of variability. Yeah, you're right. It's basically showing the same thing, just that there's there's bias, the mm -hmm. low and the high ends. And here we also see it. Uh, they say, hey, you can run uh, residuals in function of arbitrary identifier. In this case, it's the number of the row. So it's arbitrary. And they say, hey, you have some important things. This chart really likes me because they explain. You have asymmetric distribution residuals around zero. You have more negative residuals than positive residuals. I was making the math, you know, using the uh, this object, and really the negative values were sixty percent. You know, uh, it's, it, so you you don't uh, you are not good at looking up because. You can always use the math and just uh, place a table and plot table and, and get the proportion. And also, uh, we have an excess of positive values over 500. As you have, we are a corresponding uh, fraction of negative values. So basically, you see this line for residual over 500, you see some values here and even over 1,000 residuals. But you go to the negative side, you don't see the same story. What, we, you, are seeing, what you see here is another way to see the histogram that we saw before. You see that the lo location was a little bit below the zero. Here, we, that's the location, all these points. And also you don't have the long tail and the long tail is positive. So it's the same insight. It's not something different. They are just showing a different way to show to see the same the same part just in case that you wasn't able to see it for any reason because data is tricky <laughs> and you have a, a same opinion. So you have you want to see how spread is your residual. You have two options. So you will go Oh, maybe three, because also the, the boss plot is really uh, clear about them, you know? So you can check the index plot, you can set the histogram, you can set the boss plot, and see how your uh, points are distributed. Yeah, I mean, I think that index plot's also helpful to, to check if there's any sort of, like, like if, if the observations were collected over time, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you... you... It'd be interesting to see if there's a, a pattern there. Yeah, I think that that happens when you have one observation per, per time, you know, but in this case, it's, it's hard to see a pattern because yeah. you have many observations per time. And, and yeah, the same. The, you can check also the predicted values versus the residuals. And you see the same trend, so it's not something that you are making up, it's just to confirm. And also you have these the absolute values, and you see the U shape. So rather than having just a residuals are around zero, well, not around zero because you are making just the the absolute value, but they 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 spread a flat. So you you can see here how as you increase your predicted values, 
how also the receiver increase. So you have a new shape in this sense. Yeah, so, and I guess we're looking at absolute value here because we're more interested in variability. Yeah. As opposed to bias, and it, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, if you wasn't able to check uh, the the linear trend before, yeah, like this, you know, you see it, the U shape might help you also to see it, you know, to see that you have more variability in the in the high values. So we are at the end of this chapter. What we have as a tool? So problems. Uh, you can check distribution assumptions. And the distribution assumptions is not a specific distribution. You know, it's not normal. It's not a problem. No. We are expecting to see variables around zero and see uh, a constant variance. No, maybe because you have a problem with the model or with the predictions. I think because I think for discrimination, <laughs> uh, that would be my, my concern in that case. If that's not a problem to you, yeah, you can go ahead <laughs> and make good predictions, even, even though you have uh, a body, uh, available uh, variability and you are not making any uh, assumptions. Uh, uh, I don't remember the word. Uh, No, well, I don't remember. How do you say when you make a t-test, what you, you are making? Uh, you are not making any. Mm, well, I don't remember. Inference, yeah. You are not making any inference. Uh, you are not, you're just predicting. Uh, also, pro you can find problems with the assumed structure of the model in terms of selected protected variables and the inform. So as we saw for the linear model, you might want to the change, you know, the way that you present the years of construction for the linear model. So that's something that you can learn from these residuals. Also, you can see group of observation which the model presents are busy. So if you see a group of observation that are busy, what you are going to use? You are going to use your local level explanatory um, tools to find out, hey, this group have a higher. So in the index plot that we saw just be uh, ending, I would take all these group over 500, maybe uh, uh, 70, uh, 750, over 750 and try to use the local level tools to understand what are the main factors that I'm predicting this, if we can transform them, what we can do to improve the random forest. But the limitations are clear. Interpreted uh, patterns for graph is no straightforward. It's something that we need to, to do it uh, slowly, uh, the, 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 the good things that we also have chat GPT, you can ask chat GPT to, to check out your patterns. If you don't have any problems with it's a personal project or your company doesn't have, or you have a company uh, tool, you know, you can also use a uh, chat GPT also to, to check the, the patterns. Um, and also it's not immediately obvious what element you should change. So it needs investigation. So Basically, exploring uh, residuals is a good alert to learn what you need to check and where you need to pay attention in order to, to improve your modeling. But then you will need to use your prior tools for local level, for model level interpretation, and then improve your model, you know, as a continuum process. And that's the chat. Uh, any more questions? Any part that you want to go back? Uh, yeah, Angel, uh, great, great, great presentation. Uh, one comment that I have is that in those pros and cons, it usually helps, you know, especially where you are dealing with data that you are not sure, you know, how it was, uh, what is the source of the data mm -hmm. or how it was, you know, uh, assembled, you know, for the, for the machine learning model. It's usually good to get some, you know, some domain knowledge, you know, some expertise 
on how the data was was acquired. In this case, I haven't seen you know the source of these apartment prices, but for example, in real estate, mm -hmm. you see that usually some the distribution of that you know uh, a variable you know the observed values usually is skewed. Okay, you know you get a bunch of you know of uh, of of prices within a range, and then you get that long tail you know right, right skewed. So one of the things that also you can do in your analysis is try to place these observed values within, you know, within a spatial uh, pattern, okay? To see if there are some areas where the prices are really high or are really low, okay? You know, some neighborhoods that that could contribute to our lives. So maybe what you need is trying to do a different modeling for those neighborhoods. Okay. Yeah, of course. Instead of trying to catch them all with one model, uh, try to separate those neighborhoods because they have a, uh, you know, some characteristics that mm -hmm. you know uh, up the prices or low the prices, right? And 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 I don't I don't want to discuss you know the factors, but we know the factors. You know, in in cities, for example, you have places that you know they have a high crime or the schools are not good, etc. So the the prices get you know go uh, tend to be lower than other areas that are more you know, more, more, uh, more secure, better uh, yeah, transportation, more secure or better schools, uh, better roads, you know, things like that. Okay. Yeah, of course. So what mm -hmm. we can do is try to understand more or less, you know, how this data was acquired, try to model it spatially and then see, you know, if there are some patterns that you can distinguish and then try to segregate that data. So you can have a model for the, for the normal data, you know, for the more, more, uh, you know, uh, uh, range that it doesn't have those outliers and then model those neighborhoods with you know different different models and and and, and, it, and it's possible okay it's possible yeah, it is, right? then mm -hmm. the neighborhood will be you know the the key or or the or the area will be the key to then trigger that uh that 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 model part. yeah no that's a good good, good part oh, yeah and, yeah, and, yeah. And I see it because you know I you know my, mm -hmm. my regular job is is appraising uh you know, yeah, real estate and machine learning and machine machine and equipment uh, and all that, and I see it all over the place. You know that it's always a rice skewed, uh, you know, uh, uh, pattern. For you know, values. it seems also re it also remember that way to how ChatGPT works. It's a mix of experts, so mm -hmm. yep. it, it, they don't they don't care to all the ways that ChatGPT can can be used in just one model. They use many models and they take from one and another. Right. So it's like the stack model that we saw in hands-on right. machine learning. Yeah, so a combination of a tree-based linear Exactly. Deep you learning, might use that. Mm -hmm. You could get a better a, a better modeling. Yeah. A better yeah. modeling also. If, yeah. you, if you apply this step with the models that you are using as a base, you have a better understanding. Mm -hmm. Oh, when yeah. and why you are picking one observation from this and other model that's that's really interesting if you can write them allowing the black model just uh, be built you know we are your knowledge you can fit individual model and then understand when each model is better correct yeah no that's that's really good yeah we have end this this week uh, to me, it was a really interesting chapter, and um, I have for you too. So I, let's see who's the next presenting. Uh, let me also stop. The next presenting is Kent. So, guys, yeah, see I think you. we have one.